Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by the Nyaradza Group. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Nomaliso Ngobe Musasiwa, the Managing Director of Fresh In A Box and Fresh Farm. Enjoy this truly inspirational conversation. <music> Mali so Ngobe Msasiwa, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you for having me, Trevor. And uh, I, I want to start with your name, Nomali. So it's such a beautiful name. And Thank I was, you. I was just trying to figure out Nomali so in my Ndebele uh, Khosa uh, and stuff. Tell us, what does it mean? Um, according to the person who named me, my dad, it means Indombi and Tlantla, which is um, a lady of luck. Mm. Yes. So and the, and has, it, has that come through with your life as you live your life? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I don't know how I feel about luck, but yeah. genuinely, <laughs> genuinely, most of the time I've been like, oh, okay. The, my name, as yeah. it bears, I, yeah. I have moved around with a lot of luck. Well, a bit of luck. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. 2021 was a good year for you, hey? Um, you won the um, Female Farmer of the Year. Uh, you were runner-up in the Best Run Woman Startup for 2021 in the AgriPitch Hack competition. Yeah. Was that luck or hard work? Both. 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 It was talk, well prepared. <laughs> talk, talk to me about what these awards mean to you. Um, truly, it's a validation. You know, so transitioning from how I've groomed myself from schooling to what my career path was going to be to where I'm at now, it's completely changed, mm. you know, and imposter syndrome will have you all the time. Like, am I good enough for this? But I'm not qualified for this. How am I standing at this stage and how am I presenting at this stage, you mm. know, and then it's always affirming to hear somebody else say, you know what, mm. you are good at it. You mm. are excellent at it. Well done. You mm. know, somebody else noticing is always amazing, it's always affirming. Interesting that you say, given where you are and where your career path could have taken you, mm. e explain that. I mean, so I'm a mathematics graduate from the University of Zimbabwe. Even before that, I was always focused in the sciences. Ideal as a young girl, I wanted to be a doctor. Then it changed, I wanted to be a bioscientist, but everything around it was supposed to be in the medical field. Um, come to school, uni, um, I apply for the medical field. I don't get any of the medical field places. I get uh, an honors in mathematics, you know? And I'm like, okay, I have to leave and go to uni. I was given the impression that I can get to use it and change. When I got there, it was like, nah, you're not changing. So I was like, you know what? It's a degree. Let's mm. just do it. Mm. And from there, I started experiencing something about mathematics that was different. I genuinely love efficacy, you know? And mathematics affirmed a lot of that. The designs of things, how you measure certain things. And I was like, Two you know plus what? This two works. is four. Yes, it yeah. works, right? And I was like yeah, I can do this, you know, started thinking about maybe actuary or a data scientist. It started coming up, but then was never in the farming field, for instance. And after graduating, you're like, okay, jobs, mm -mm, mm. you know, and then I found myself a farmer. So from that trajectory to where I'm at now, none of it I'm qualified for what I'm doing right now. That's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. What does that say about the, the, the trajectory that you have taken? Do you see this in other people's lives? Because I see with my with, with my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, the things I'm doing right now, I never went to school to do. Yeah. Uh, but I found myself doing those things and found myself actually excelling. What, what's, what's your sense of that? Um, it's adaptability, you mm -hmm. know, and I think a lot of us Zimbabweans have learned to adapt. But not only adapt, it's surviving. You know, I, I believe I'm a survivor of many people's decisions. A lot of people's decisions. I don't know who made the decision mm. of me getting an honors mathematics classroom <laughs> with 10 males in it mm. and two women. But it was somebody else's decision. Mm. It's always been somebody else's decision how the world goes. I, I'm, I'm a simple responder. And having to know that I can survive it and I will figure it out when I'm over there, <laughs> when I'm over the bridge, it's always been 
one of those things that says, okay, it's not that bad. Mm. And trusting myself that, you know what, I'm going to get through it. Mm. But you also have to pitch up, eh? Yeah, you showing have to up. show up. Absolutely. You have to absolutely show up. You, you cannot. But some days it's been hard to wake up mm. and show up, you know? Mm. Especially during uni. I did my degree in six years instead of four. No. I so, saw that and, yeah. and explain that, why you, you were struggling with, with uni, were there other factors that uh, made you stumble and fall and pick yourself up? So there are two main factors, right? Number one, if I had already known that going to university to do a bachelor's degree is more about discipline of doing the things that you may never use, more than understanding what you are doing, I would have gotten through that quicker, right? But my first year of university was the toughest. Moving from Bulayo my whole life, I was born in Bulayo, bred in Bulayo, so I'm in Debelego. I moved to Mashona land, you walk into class, and the first thing the teacher says, all right, vurai mabu. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> sorry, sir. Yeah. <laughs> what? And, okay, so you catch on a few things, but then like explaining a whole mathematical concept, in Shona mm -hmm. and have everyone say, okay, are we all clear? That's the first English line that you're going to get after a whole mathematical concept has been explained and everyone goes, yes, in the classroom and you're like, oh, sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> can we take that again? And you have to now clarify to say, please um, use English, mm -hmm. you know? I was so very fortunate that after a while of that and after like failing my first semester, our chairman at the, at the time was Professor Stewart. He's a white man, so he was like, are you telling me that you're doing all your classes in Shona? It was very difficult, you know? And so that transition and also getting my lecturers to then be sensitive enough to remember that there's a person who doesn't understand mm. the language. Whilst I'm there and learning the language, it's not enough for me to be able to grasp the concepts that we're learning in class. Mm. That was my most difficult one. But when we then went on, you know, like first year is just easy things. Yeah. So you can catch up on it. But going on into the degree, there was a lot of things where you'd look and say, where does this apply in life? And I'm so much of a seeking to understand more than just to know person, mm. right? Where does mm. this apply? And the moment I don't understand, I can't cram it. I can't, and the exam requires you to yeah. at least know it. Yeah. And it's only up until like my fourth year, right? When one of my doctors said, uh, Nube, it's mm. not about understanding. This is a game of discipline, mm. you know? And I'm like, well, you should have said so. <laughs> Then I would have known. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. That, that's what that was one of the hardest things. I, I, I think there's a lesson there. What would you say then to the many thousands of people wanting to go to university to study the many universities that, are, that, that we have in this country? What advice would you give to the young, young people for them to be prepared for this season? Um, university in undergraduate is supposed to be your template of what the world looks like experience it fully mm -hmm. your degree is what you do for a living mm -hmm. <laughs> but the environment in itself the communities that are built there the the politics even that exists there mm -hmm. is supposed to prepare you for what the real world is like it's mm -hmm. a very nice controlled mm -hmm. environment for mm -hmm. you to stretch yourself test yourself fail and try again right. you know and while you're at it if you think that you can change your skill, change it fast. That's mm. what I would say. That's interesting. That's good advice, that. And, and tell me, so a mathematician mm -hmm. now turned into a farmer. When did the passion grab you, the passion for, for farming. Ag farming, agriculture? I think I translated it because my passion is still, like I said earlier, efficiencies in, in systems. Mm -hmm. So when um, Fresh in a Box had run for about a year, we were having troubles with our supply chain because we'd have our smallholder farmers who will also get caught by the wave of chichirugi tamari, mm. you know, what's making money right now? Oh, it's cabbages, then everyone has cabbages. But my box has got 16 different types of vegetables that I need to deliver perfect to my customers. How do I control that? So we started trying to tweak around with the, the grower scheme, mm -hmm. right? But in the grower scheme, yes, by designing it, is easy to do. Okay, Trevor gives us on Monday, Kuda does it on Tuesday, then I does it on Wednesday. That That's easy, right? Mm. But then you don't know how long does it take to grow a baby marrow? How long does it take to grow a carrot? How do I structure them? So the more I became inquisitive about modeling this grower scheme, mm. 
the more I was like, okay, there's so much more that I don't know. So I need to learn, right? Mm -hmm. I looked at my 16 different vegetables and I'm like, I'm going to know intrinsically what it takes because now when I want to speak to a farmer and tell them my expectations, I can't be coming from a place of ignorance. Mm. I need to be at least very knowledgeable about why am I expecting this much, mm -hmm. you know? And doing that over time, I started thinking, oh, okay, so there's a way I could probably supplement this. And I was like, huh. I wonder if I could farm. I wonder if I could farm. And as the universe would have it, <laughs> we got an offer to rent a farm, which is now the Fresh Farm. Mm. But already the Fresh Farm was already existing as a virtual farm mm -hmm. with about, at that time, I think we had about 200 different farmers. We had about four to five hectares. So yeah. um, that was still good. Having your own 10 hectare farm, yeah. that's a different <laughs> story. Learning about soil tests and so forth. There was like so much to learn that the more I went into it, I was like, okay, so why are farmers, why are, far, why are we as farmers? Because mm. I'm now part of them. Mm. Why are we as farmers not getting the best out of our harvest? You know, starting to learn that, oh, okay, so if I don't timely um, spray for pestilence or protect against diseases, this is what happens. And the more I learned and the world at large has got so much information about farming, I was like, okay, this is my new thing. I like it. And the math again, two plus two is four. Put seed in the ground mm. with correct conditions, water it as it required, protect it as required, it will bear fruit for you. Mm. Spiritually, physics, or even just mentally, it was just simple, simple math. And I was like, I can do this. And how long have you been doing it now? The farming. Mm. I'll be clocking three years, three years in August. And you're thoroughly enjoying it. Loving it. There's a perception out there that farming is backbreaking. It's it's tough. And from what you're saying right now, you know, put the seed in the ground. That's money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, spray Carefully. against that. Uh, you know, whatever. That's money. Mm -hmm. uh, take it to the market. That's money. It's backbreaking. It's expensive. Is, is that a misperception on my part? It's not a misperception, mm. but. Who isn't breaking their back in whatever industry? Right. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's just a different type of job. So it is back breaking, but then why are you doing it yeah. is important. If your why is very clear, best believe the back won't hurt. And the reward itself is just amazing. I can't even tell you how my first successful tomato crop was after like four tries. Mm. That crop? I was like, I was so joyful. I even called my mom. I'm like, you know what? I finally got my 15 kgs per plant. Wow. You know, I was very excited because I was like, either I'm the one who's not doing correct or their science is wrong. And mm. I tried everything possible to make sure. And because I gave it that attention to detail and that mm. love, mm. I got that result. Mm. And because I now know that that happens, I am never at any point looking at agriculture and say, it's backbreaking. It it wants love, it wants passion, it wants drive, it wants your commitment. Wake up, mm. do the job, mm. and watch the results flow. You, you've just touched on something that I particularly like, uh, which is when you find the why, uh, everything falls into place and it keeps you on track. Why do you do what you do? Because it makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, That's interesting. It, it, it adds up. Yeah. Um, with everything that I do, it's number one, people will always eat regardless whether the economy is upside down mm. people will eat eat less eat more but they will eat right and why do i want to do it i know that at the end of what i'm working the process that i'm working on somebody else's belly will be fed somebody will have food on their table i may not know who they are mm. but then i am contributing towards that mm. Th that's my why wow that's, yeah. a, that's a powerful why the given the there's a sense I'm getting that it's become, for a lack of a better word, it's become sexy to do farming. It's the in thing. It's a, there's a movement for yeah. young people to get into farming. Mm -hmm. There's a movement for young women to get into farming. A am I exaggerating or that's the sense that you're getting to? It, it is the sense. I'd like to say it is the sense. I think right. in the turn of um, 20, 2017, 2018, a lot of the conversations around farming became important. But food security was this term, you know? Mm. It's like food security, but it's like, it is growing of food. Right. How, how do we 
all grow food and enjoy doing it. And I think the more we we all got to say, okay, I've tried it. I'm enjoying it. And then the next person says, I tried it. I'm enjoying it. It's like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Now, everybody has got a farming side hustle because it's like, and really and truly out of your daily mundane work, if you go into a small garden and you're like, okay, let me do this. Afterwards, you feel rather good about it. Mm. it may be tiring but then you do real, really feel good about it so it has become that and i think the conversations and the branding around it to say it's not necessarily about hard labor it's not necessarily about those without working the hardest it's about feeding the general populace mm. it's about nourishing our health the, the way it has been framed because we farming has, has been there <laughs> since time in yeah. memorial but the way it has been framed it has made it look very attractive like I'm, I'm seeing it on social media and I'm seeing quite a lot of excitement around around farming. And I'm, I've been saying to myself, and of course, you know, social media presents these things in a very attractive way. And yeah. you see more and more people coming in and you see hashtags coming in. And I was thinking, correct me here, is it because the other fields, because of the economy, are closed? People can't get into manufacturing, people can't do other things, and yet some people have pieces of land that they've been, not been working on. How much of effect is that as far as this revolution is concerned? The barrier of entry is low. Aha. Uh -huh. Do you have a tool yeah. that you can use to dig yeah. a hole? Okay. Start. Okay. <laughs> That's all as it takes, right? As easy as that. Yeah. As easy as that. Yeah. Um, you probably are not doing it for monetary purposes. You're probably doing it just to be self-sufficient. Mm. You bought a tomato from a a local supermarket, harvest the seed, mm. put it in the ground, and watch it grow. Right. You know what I mean? So the way social media has structured everything is that nobody ever tells the tough stories. And even if you yeah. do, you light blow. <laughs> you don't do it hard. It's a very light blow. So it will always look attractive. But the field in itself is really good. COVID, on the other hand, mm. really changed a lot of things. The only place where you could still participate and everyone else would then accept product became farming mm. you mm. know where, where do people like i said earlier people would want to eat eat more eat less mm. they're going to eat mm. so. tell me so you've got you're running a 10 hectare horticulture farm mm. describe to us what your day is like point number one, uh, when it starts and where it ends. And secondly, what variety are you, are you farming? What crops are you, are you working on? Okay. Um, so how does my day start? Yeah. 4 a.m. <laughs> Seriously? Four, yes. I, I do a little bit of Robin Sharma's 5 a.m., but at 4, Yeah. right? And then I am ready at 5 a.m. I have to do with my daughter who's going to be up around about that time. And then at uh, 5.30, I walk out to the field. I meet up with my supervisors uh, and then we look at our work schedule. Um, what are we working on today? Which fields need spraying? Which field needs um, fertilizers? Which fields are now ready for growing? So because of our 365 model of growing where we want number one to harvest daily mm -hmm. and also plant daily, we can't have fallow land. Mm. 10 hectares may sound like a lot. It is a lot, but then it's quite small when you're trying to grow daily and harvest daily mm. so i we cannot afford to have fallow land so that's the first thing so it's walking into a certain field and then also assessing from this field have we gotten enough to revitalize it you know have we harvested what our targets were or has this been like right now it's the rainy season i have a patch of cabbage that didn't succeed you know so what do we do about it? Is it because of the rain? Too yeah. much rain? The rain, the rains are there a lot. There you go. You know, the yeah. rains are a lot. So it's like, okay, what do we do? Let's take them out. Mm. Let's prep the land and mm. let's find what's our next solution. So what's our next planting according to our planning schedule? After that, um, the farm workers walk in at around quarter to six. We uh, greet each other and um, I give them my expectations of the day, their targets. I do individual targets simply because I don't believe that much that communal work is how we go at it. I think communal work makes us lazy. So we measure each other individually, yeah. you know. So when that's done, I then go into my office, um, process the orders that are there, and then 
um, everything else now is taken over to Fresh in a Box. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what time do you hit the pillow? At home. Mm. My daughters go to sleep at 7.30. I go to sleep at 8.30. Wow. One hour and what, crop, what crops are we looking at? What, 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 um, how many my crops? My major crops. Yeah. My major five crops are cabbage, uh, lettuce, tomato, um, green beans, and carrots. Okay. Those are my major five. Yeah. But then I also actually yeah. dabble into like things like spring onion, herbs, um, yellow, green, red peppers, and a few uh, onions. Okay. I've never been that prosperous with onions. So I do a bit of red onion but then like i i really lean on my other suppliers to to bring in the other that. stuff yeah and, and talk talk to me about the 365 model is that a thing or is this is your creation it's a creation <laughs> <laughs> talk to us about the 365 it's a, it's a model yeah so ideally in farming there's something that's called the season yeah. right um i started hearing about the season when i worked in nembudia story for another day but um the season is 90 to 120 days, four months, mm -hmm. right? Where you plant seed and you wait for it to mature to mm. its stage where it's being harvested. And ideally, that's okay if you have huge tracts of land, number one. And if you can wait that long and what you're going to harvest is going to take you up to the next right. cycle, right. right? But with horticulture, a patch of cabbages, great, you can do 30,000 cabbages. They'll give you around about... Uh, six eight thousand in profit mm. but then that's not enough to keep you going until the next 90 days yeah. so i was like okay how do i make sure that number one i harvest harvest enough not to lose out at some point because in my first year of farming i find out that oh okay i had great cabbage 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 then it's done it's like oh i need to wait another 90 days mm. so i have no income for another 90 days i was like okay there's got to be a way around this wow. so i then did design the model which we use at our farm still under testing hoping that you know we succeed but so far so good on mm. things like cabbage and tomato i produce daily and i also have like uh, consistent. As Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information, and any other queries concerning payments, policy information, or products and services. Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus 263-712-992892 or register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now, join in and experience a new level of convenience 24 hours a day with Sawi. The other thing that uh, I found fascinating is that you're working with, uh, you call yourself uh, a serial collaborator. Yeah. You're working with over 2,000 farmers. Yeah. Describe that to us, what, what, it, what it looks like and what, is it, what it is intended to achieve. It's headachey, but ah. it's, a, it's designed to achieve consistent and quality production, right? So with our farmers that we work with, we have very seasoned farmers who don't need hand-holding. Mm. We have new incoming farmers who need hand-holding. So it's like, okay, let's let's see, what you, what, are, you, are you starting to farm? Okay, what do you want to farm? They usually is the normal, the cabbage, the tomato. But because I'm already producing that, I then tend to say, okay, let's try something that's more easier to maintain. Fine beans, you know? This is how you grow your fine beans. This is your schedule of spraying, feeding, and so forth. And then on this day, I'll come and collect. Why we then want, or why we work with so many of us is that... Are these outgrowers, or what, what, what's, what's the model? Are they outgrowers? Or? Outgrowers and independent growers, okay. right? So right. there are some who literally just grow according to our plan. They feed into Fresh in a Box, some of it, mm -hmm. but then they also feed into other wholesalers because mm -hmm. the version of Fresh in a Box was to be good enough to be a business to customer and also business to other businesses. Mm -hmm. So because we now know other businesses who 
have suffered the same thing as us from farmers, inconsistency, and you can't guarantee the quality. We've gone back to the value chain and said, let us have a handle on that mm. to be able to have consistent growing, a specific quality. That way we're able to say to the wholesalers, you can guarantee yourself that if you're working with us mm. and the farmers that are under us, you will always have the same type of production all the time. Mm. You know that your stores are filled with the same product. Your customer will never walk in and say, oh, last time mm. you had like really fresh and good ones. This time, mm, What's you know, happened? Yeah. yeah. You never want the customer to be like, and then what happened? Mm. So I guess that's why we then designed the 365. That's why we then got to collaborate with other farmers. Mm. It's when you do the 365 that you realize that 10 hectares of land is huge tracts of land, but not that huge. Mm. And, and how many people does Fresh Box, the farm, the 10 hectare hectare farm, how many people do you employ? 29. 29 people. Yes. And um, there's this, there's this uh, thing that you spoke about. Mm -hmm. Chichiru um, fire, and everybody <laughs> goes for tomatoes and so forth. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that when everybody thinks that uh, it's the mango season, mangoes are making money, it's the tomato season, everybody rushes, and you go onto Harare Drive or wherever and you find everybody on the road, on the side road, is selling thing. tomatoes. How do you deal with that? To be honest, we haven't figured it out. <laughs> okay. It's not yet figured out. Yeah. I think to the women that I work with, I say, stay consistent mm. and there's absolutely nothing wrong with expanding your portfolio you want to do mangoes do mangoes mm. but then don't get off track with what is consistent mm. you know there's nothing wrong with trying here and there just don't move your whole portfolio to the new what's happening mm. now because mm. what's happening now gets flooded and i think it's been one of the biggest lessons for every farmer we had does that get through though it does. Farmers, yeah? it, it's just okay. it's a tough lesson. Yeah. You know, it's a very tough lesson. If you learn that using your money, going back to plant is an impossibility, you yeah. know. Yeah. And because of that, it, it really sometimes derails other people from going into the farming. I tried tomatoes, but then the market was flooded. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do it. And then come January, the tomato is now like the highest. <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> the highest. Like, I, should have, oh, yeah. I should have continued. Yeah. So it's like, okay, let me get back to it. And then mm. you're like in April and the price is dipping. You know, it's, it's a stock market of its mm. own. Mm. So we haven't figured it out, but I think the lessons of experience are coming out for, for more farmers that mm. steady, you know, mm. just stay with it and using your data. I think that's one thing that I always emphasize to our farmers. Say, use the data that we've had. Your record collection will tell you that on this day I planted something, to this point, the market was flooded. So how do I shift mm, the flood? Data. Because when the market stops flooding, the price spikes. Fascinating. Yeah. So uh, clearly, uh, you and your husband, Kudam Sasiwa, yeah. have grown uh, fresh in a box from nothing uh, inside five, six years. What do you... How do you explain your success, first of all, as uh, Nomaliso, as a farmer? How do you explain your su success? What are the success factors? And secondly, how do you explain uh, the manner in which Fresh in a Box has taken off? Um, if I say Fresh in a Box was built from nothing, it will be disingenuous. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, social capital that we've gotten from Kuda's character, mm -hmm. you know, and that has helped us build the brand. The, the, the story of transitioning from this notorious character into somebody who is um, contributing to society into, oh, no, it's not about him. It's a whole business. You know, that transition on its own has been one of the success factors of Fresh in a Box. Mm -hmm. But for Nomali, so as a person, it's been the support of my family mm -hmm. saying, it's OK, you are not doing mathematics try what's there, mm. you know? And having a partner that says, well, let's try it. Mm. I don't care how crazy the idea is. Mm. Well, let's try it mm. is a good thing for us. You know, it, it has helped us try, test, reiterate, go back to the drawing board, do, be an easy process, mm. you know? And, and your role at Fresh in a Box at the moment is managing director. Mm -hmm. And that entails day-to-day -day management of fresh in a box and the farm too. Yes. Is, is that what, it, what, it, what your portfolio looks like? Operationally, yes. All yeah, right. However, I've moved a whole lot into the farming space and have left for our other, um, the other co-founder to deal with the operations. But at the beginning, I, it was merging the operations of from the farm 
into fresh in a box the entity and then to the customer mm. so the designer of how we pack the box was definitely also some of my mathematical <laughs> workings <laughs> uh, to how much does a box averagely weigh and what does it mean what kind of box do we use and so forth that was all in the operations how which systems do we use to pack do we use a pulley system to pack how do we then position the people to stand and so forth the economics that was all me then everything else that everyone sees that's Oh, could <laughs> Wow. So which, what do you enjoy most? Being on the farm or doing the, uh, the office stuff? What do you enjoy most? The farm. The farm. That's the air. It is wow. beautiful. Tell me about the box. What is in a box, point number one? And how did you go into deciding what goes into a box? Okay. So um, we decided to say, what does a family of four to which we are a family of five now, but at the time we we're, were a family of, no, we're a family of six now. <laughs> we we're a family of four at the time, right? And we're like, okay, what does a family of four eat? You know, some potatoes, some tomatoes, some onions, you know, spring onion for uh, garnishing, some greens, spinach, mm -hmm. and then um, butternut is a good, those are all things that are now in the box. So the more we, we're looking at what do we eat? You know, we're like, okay, so this is randomly what people would eat, right? And then the first time when we sent the box out, we'll get feedback from yeah. our customers. Um, why wouldn't you guys try a bit of baby marrow? I like those. Can I have them in the box? And it's like, oh, okay, baby marrows. And then you meet the farmer who's like, I tried baby marrows. I've got a lot of them. Some are now as big as courgettes. And they're like, okay, we're going to put courgettes. We're going to put baby marrows in the box. And the more we iterated the box, we then came down to saying these are our 12 to 16 vegetables that we put because some are seasonal so you won't always get mm, them but mm. then those that are there we definitely grow to make sure that they're there mm -hmm. yeah so that's what's in the box roughly your potatoes your butternut are uh, your cabbage mm. um then the red cabbage comes in here and there mm. uh your beets your baby marrows your spinach and your uh mm. spring onion you have onions, tomatoes, the normal ones. You know, like you, have no, to count them. you have no idea <laughs> the joy I'm getting listening to normally. So young Zimbabwean woman talking about farming. I mean, that's just, just excites me. <laughs> Talk to me about how much data and technology do you guys use? Um, because I get the sense as a mathematician that the, are they algorithms in the background is there artificial intelligence that you guys are using <laughs> <laughs> artificial intelligence definitely not <laughs> definitely yeah. not yeah. algorithms very rudimentary mm -hmm. because an algorithm is just a system that's developed by putting certain yeah. blocks together you know until you study and run the data through but we definitely are dependent on the data of our production so we know which days in the month become our lowest sales and we now have studied what makes them the lowest sales, you know, wow. which days in the month are our highest sales. So we now need to make sure that production is at its highest at that mm. point. We know what is the preferred product that is being bought by our customers. You know, we know what generally makes a customer very happy, what doesn't make them happy. We, we use a lot of that data to, to then say, this is how we're going forward. It mm. influences the decisions we make on a very daily basis. Mm. Yeah. And so you are in the middle. Mm -hmm. You are a farmer. You are running this business. You are getting uh, produce from other farmers. You are supplying individuals, corporates, restaurants. Is that what it looks like? Yes. And where, where if you were to divide it in terms of uh, individuals, corporates, Households, what does it look like in terms of your, your, your supply? Our supply. Mm. We are very big on customers and individuals, wow. okay. right? We've had the best response from there. But we have started growing in the last year and a year and a half with other businesses. A lot of the corporates for their canteens and a lot of other our competitors, if I could say <laughs> something like that, they they also now source from us, so which is a good thing. Yeah. Revenue is revenue for me at the end of the day. So those are now becoming big, but then our biggest sector has got to be our custom individual mm. customers who mm. buy. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. You 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 you. I'm going to use your the term that you use to describe your husband. You say the notorious character, <laughs> uh, powerful character. Uh, Kuda has been mm -hmm. uh, and is, mm -hmm. uh, and so are you. Um, and looking at how couples uh, 
it's problematic for couples to work together and make things work. How is that working for you, for the two of you? These two strong characters with social capital in the market. How do you how do you make this thing work? Is it working? It's working. Yeah, it's absolutely working. Um, how we make it work is before we even started all of this. I think we took time during our dating phase to understand what's your strength, what's your weakness, and we generally allow the other person to play when it's their turn to play yeah. because we understand that the spotlight becomes wider when we share it, you know? So that's okay with us. But then what he is good at, we emphasize most. What he is not good at, hopefully mm. I am good at, I pick up the slack. Mm -hmm. What I am not good at and what he is good at he absolutely picks up the slack. Mm -hmm. So it's not what it's one of those where you definitely can know. It creates a certain level of complacency right. to say, I know that my yeah. partner is going to say she's, she's they're going to they have he's, this he's got this. He's got this. He's got you this. know what I mean? I many things I'm I may not be able to do, but I definitely know that this one thing, mm -hmm. he's got it covered. Mm -hmm. So over time, again, mm. the iterations, mm. the, you know, our clear communication, this is my expectation or this is my frustration at mm. the moment. Let's mm. go back to the drawing mm. table. Um, my expectation was, because mm. the frustration comes from expectation. Yes. My expectation was, um, the other will ask you, did you communicate that clearly? Yeah. <laughs> and if you have communicated yeah. it clearly, yeah. it's, it's always a once-off thing. It's cleared out and mm. we continue. Mm. And th that's what has been working for us in the marriage and in the business. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, let me get back to, so who is Normally So? Where were you born, uh, Normally So? And where did you go to school? Okay, so Normally So is um, a daughter, <laughs> it's obvious. But I'm a mom of two girls, a stepmom of three, beautiful kids, and uh, a wife. That's, mm. that's, that's who I am. Mm. I was born in Wulawayo, Lady Rodwell, <laughs> if that counts. But I grew up in Lady, Luvebe Lady 5. Rodwell Clinic. Yes. Hospital or clinic, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in Luvebe 5. Mm -hmm. That's where I grew up most of my life until maybe I was 13. That's when I transitioned to live in the CBD of, of, of Bulawayo. Mm -hmm. But I'm a Bulawayo girl. Mm -hmm. And which schools did you go to? Um, primary school was um, Fusi primary school in Guabalanda and then um, part of that I then went to Fairview uh, Adventist primary school uh, secondary school I went to Mchabezi high school and then uh, high school I went to Dominican convent mm. you, you say that um, these changes that you went through with schools uh, prepared you for life uh, what lessons did you get from from the changes I mean you did uh, four or five uh, primary <laughs> schools <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the adaptation and maybe mm. the culture shock that I used to get every time. So transitioning from Fusi was a, a government school in a local neighborhood where we used to live to going to Fairview was mm. a private school at that time that was developing in the Adventist community. So we're, I was brought up Adventist. It was the primary, it was the private school that was developing then. The shock of how other people live yeah. from you living in the in the locations if i could say you know it was it was real it was so townships real that, i called them yes <laughs> in the, the townships yeah you know, it was it was such a it was a different space mm. i wake up in the morning i am driven to school what a privilege i get to school and i'm like um this is not how we do at our house you know but then also the type of education system it was more inclined to the american type of education mm. system it mm. demanded a whole lot than four subjects mm. i used to do i think about eight nine subjects in primary school but it was it was very shaking and you know it made you tough it made you want to be out there right then transitioning into high school i go into a mission school my God. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? How was the transition? Ah, it Mission was so school. tough. Yeah. You know, you, In what way? You now have this polished accent, right? It's been polished by this private primary school that you've been to. Um, and you get to a place where people say your mode of communication assumes that you want to feel like you're better than somebody else, which is not true, mm. you know? And then trying to adapt backwards, say, but I'm like you guys, I'm like you guys, I'm trying to fit in again. It was 
a very tough one. But not only that, it was the cold water bathing, mm. you know, in the morning. <laughs> it was structured. Um, you wake up at this time. You go and eat at this time. You go to school at this time. It was so structured that you had to learn to be a foot soldier, if I could mm. just put it like that, to say, this is how I've designed my life. And I guess the, the structure in which I use now in my life is based on the boarding school upbringing. That's I can tell you, most people who've gone to boarding school will tell you that the way they structure their lives, you put them in a, be free, yeah. do what you want. Yeah. They tend to spaz or something <laughs> short circuits, you know, because they're used to a certain type That's of sort order. Sort of military type uh, discipline and order, yeah? Yes, they're yeah. used to a certain type of order. And from that, you know, I... I learned a blocking mm. of certain things. You, you do certain things at a certain, certain time. time. So one thing that I can't even I will admit publicly, I'm not a multitasker. Uh -huh. One thing at a time, complete it as fast as I can, and then on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know? So that's how I can say, yes, I manage both Fresh in a Box and the Fresh Farm. Mm. Because everything has its time. Yeah. I'm not doing Fresh in a Box at a time when I'm not supposed to be doing Fresh wow, in a Box. that's you know? interesting. So, yeah. And, and it, your parents divorced. Yes. Um, at, at what point? How old were you? I was 13 years old. Okay. Yes, I was 13 years old. The, the, what, what was that like for you? Has it left any indelible marks? Has it left any uh, bitterness in you? What lessons is that, that that are bringing with parents separated done to you? Um, Bitterness, maybe I've dealt with for a long time, mm. right? But then um, my parents divorcing was, for me, a, it was a tough transition, but then I understood why they were doing it. At the same time, it was still difficult because I now had to survive people's decisions, as I said before. Yeah. It was their decision to break away from each other because their marriage wasn't working. But I had to now deal with each one of them going through their own heartache, mm. their own transitioning, their own trying to find themselves in the middle of that. Being able to parent wasn't their priority or their best <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> oh, you know? yeah. So that that had me in oh. many different screws at a time where I am preteen, going into teen. Um, both my parents are going through it. I am going through it. And it's like one hell of a mess. But I've grown to heal that part of myself because of the way my current family is structured mm. you know the the way i've also had to be I'm, I'm with a person who's been who's been divorced you know their children how has them going through their own mm. things you know having to then liaise with my husband and be like a bridge between my stepchildren and him to say okay i would like for you to just remember that Yes, the heartache is there, but then this heartache has nothing to do with the parenting yeah. aspect, you know. Or I would like for you as the children to take a moment and just understand that this person has just gone through mm. the most. Mm. They're going through it. How much grace are we extending for them? And um, let's just be aware that you are still priority to both your parents. Mm. You are allowed to have both your parents. You're going to have maybe two sets of parents mm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. have double of both that is the beauty of what it. a blessing you know that's the beauty of it i i got to enjoy from my parents the double birthdays double christmas you know double everything anything that was celebratory was double and i guess even the things that were not celebratory were kind of double so you have to do with it in that manner as Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information, and any other queries concerning payments, policy information, or products and services, Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus two six three seven one two double nine two eight nine two or register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now join in and experience a new level of convenience 24 hours a day with Sawi. That's interesting, Namadisa, because that's a that's a 
perception issue. You've changed, you, you're changing around a situation that could have been pretty negative and, and destructive into something absolutely beautiful. I mean, uh, where does that come from? Growing up, I guess, and then realizing that you can mop around about that people made a decision about their lives and it affected you. Mm. Accepting that it affected me and then saying, okay, how much of that still affects me? Mm. Because um, some cost fallacy would have to mm. say that whatever happened before does not necessarily translate that everything that's going to happen in the future is because of the reasons mm. that were there before. So mm. I, I, I quickly then decided that, you know, um, it has happened. Yeah. Life is different. This is what it how is. How do I yeah. how do I maneuver yeah. it being different? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I it everything will change, but then what does Normalisa want and how mm. do I make sure she gets what she wants? Mm. Yeah. It, there seems to be a values grounding. There seems to be a principles grounding. Uh, where does it come from? Is this is this something you got from your mom, from your dad? Is is it is it a Faith, where, where does it come from? I mean, that's so pure. That's such a pure place. Um, let me see. To be very honest, I think it came from the lesson, the things that I did not want out of seeing my parents. Wow. You know, the I don't want that. And being able to identify from a negative place that I do not want that mm. was easy to transpose. What do I then want? Mm. I don't want a tumultuous home that has violence in it. My husband will tell you, Anything is permissible in our marriage, but <laughs> violence, that is a complete deal breaker, you know. <laughs> so that in itself, for one, to say, I, I, I don't want that. I, I don't want to be with a person that I can't communicate with and they don't hear me. I don't mm. want to be in a space where I'm not in good books with my extended family or my extended family is having so much influence into how things were. The more I identified what were the things that I didn't want, I was able to say, this is what I want. And I guess it's the indoctrination of the Adventist community. It was easier to say, okay, this we do, this we don't do. This we do, this we don't do. Again, that's interesting. For a lot of people, it's not, I'm seeing this, what is it that I don't like in that? It's a, particularly when you are formative years, mm. it's I see this, it models who I become. But you made a choice that I see this, what is it that I don't like in that? I find that fascinating. Uh, I'll, I'll give up to my grandfather before he passed. Yeah. He, he was the one who probably set me down and told me that this is either going to make you or yeah. break you. Yeah. And that is completely your decision. What are you going to do about wow. it? That's powerful. Just that. That's and powerful. Uh, it's always been, what are you going to do about it? Mm. You know, well, what are you going to do about divorced parents? Mm -hmm. Can you bring them back together? Mm. <laughs> Can you fix their problems? Mm. No. So what are you going to do about it? And doing everything that is within your power as an individual will always propel you forward. Mm. Do you have any siblings? Yes, I do. How many? Two. Okay. Have, yes. have they turned out like you? Uh, we're all developing into our own people. <laughs> <laughs> we're all developing into our own people. I have a younger brother. Yeah. He's 24. And then my younger sister is six years old. So you're the firstborn? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. So normally, so you are a stepmother to three. Yes. And the mother to two. Mm -hmm. There are stereotypes about stepmoms and their relationship with their, with their stepchildren. Um, what's, your, what's your relationship like with your, with your stepkids and your biological kids? You know, truly, Trevor, I am blessed to oh. have them in my life, the kids. Um, we have a very good relationship. And I think it's from two aspects. Having gone through what they went through or what they're going through number one and number two our age difference so i'm not as i'm significantly younger than my husband and i'm also significantly older than my than my stepkids so i'm like in the middle and mm. i become the bridge mm. i am very much relatable to them and more of a how do we process this for dad yeah. to understand yeah. half the time kind of person <laughs> <laughs> i'm also a very easy button mm. to if i say manipulate it would sound wrong but someone to say okay can i sound this through you and do you think it would work mm. I, we have a very brilliant rapport mm. and uh, uh, so we've never had a, a a situation where we are 
making each other replace certain mm. elements mm. of our lives. There's mom, there's dad, mm. there's stepmom. Mm. We don't even call each other that. You know what I mean? That's beautiful. They, they call me my D yeah. and you call them by their name. So typically the, the, oh. the label in itself is not always, yeah, stepmom. The, the label sometimes is what's wrong, isn't it? Is it though? I think so. I mean, stepmom, step, stepchild, uh, rather than my D, um, to me that seems to 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 work. This this label makes this thing not look very nice. But who is labeling? Is it the stepmother to the stepchild, mm. or is it the rest of the community who are not in the relationship? Mm. Because I've never had a problem with the labeling of the relationship. Yeah. I've always wanted to know how does the relationship itself mm. between. Mm. Um, mm this new person that has gone into somebody else's life who they didn't originate yeah. with, how are they relating? Mm. If that is good, how you label it, for what purposes you label it, mm. it doesn't matter. Mm. I, I don't think it matters most to me, at least. Plus and it, I, I'm hoping that as life goes on, we can show each other that it really doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, the label doesn't matter, the yeah. relationship does. Matters, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. So um, the viewers will realize that, uh, will notice that this is the first time that uh, my hair is this long. <laughs> and it's because my 16-year-old daughter has challenged me, says, Dad, I don't want you to cut your hair. I want to see how long it's going to go. So let's see how long this hair grows. But okay. why I'm saying that is, what have your kids taught you? My kids, okay. It's not that deep. <laughs> <laughs> They would say, yeah. um, the, it's, it's, it's not always that deep one. Mm. But then um, my youngest, my daughters, mm. importantly, everything has got a silver lining. Uh -huh. Mom, I'm upset, I'm throwing a tantrum, but as soon as you calm me down, I'll be happy, I'll be smiling, and I'll be, mm. you know, chappy with you. Mm. I want to cry for you, but I want to also be happy with you, mm. you know. That, those are the things that I've learned from my kids that you, it's not always doom and gloom. This too shall pass. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever it is. Yeah. It's a, and the only way to go about it is through it. Mm. Yeah. Normally, so you, you, you have very strong political views. <laughs> Two questions. Where does that come from for a mathematician who's turned a, uh, into a farmer? Uh, where does this originate? And talk to me about that. My dad. Your dad? Yes. Okay. Is he alive? Yes, he is. Okay. He's very much alive, very healthy. Yeah. Um, my father has never been one to stand up for injustice, mm. you know, however way he does it, you know, he's got his own flaws, but he always was in the community and be the loudest voice, be Who heard. Who is your father? Who is your father? Uh, All right. A general citizen, very okay. active citizen of society. Okay. I mean, he's not someone who's famous or anything like that. But in our little community that we lived in, he was definitely one of those people who was always there for justice or always there to help. Let's make things keep moving. Mm. Why is our drainage that goes in front of all of our yards, the 10 of us who are in the line, clogged up? Let's, let's clean that up. Mm. See, little basic mm. things like mm. that. But he was never the person to sit back and not say something mm. or not do anything about mm. it. And I guess that's where I got it from, to say, have the courage to speak up. You know, sometimes you'll go against the grain, yeah. but be sure that when you're speaking up, you're speaking up for what is right. Mm. You know, then we can debate the scales of what is right and what isn't right, what is moral and what isn't, but always stand for what is right. Mm. You know, that, that, that's where most of my political views are fundamentally built from. Mm. You, we have an election coming up in mm -hmm. 2023. What issues, as speaking as a young person, as a, as a, as a, as a woman in, in business, what issues should this election in 2023 resolve? Number one, I would say they, if I say they, I hope I can say they, if I say they, they, they need to address their in-house issues to show us that they are capable human beings to take us forward. Mm -hmm. I think that is now the biggest thing with us as young people that 
are you are they capable do they have the capacity to do certain so things they, the question they is mdc they is an pf which is, which is everyone who thinks they want to stand up okay. and use the term being the voice of the voiceless mm -hmm. to say before you speak as the voice clear up be mm -hmm. audible mm -hmm. what is it that you're saying mm -hmm. are, are you sure you're saying what we are saying mm -hmm. you know just the, the self i think mm -hmm. in the institutions themselves that everyone politically is building let's be clear about what we fundamentally stand for mm -hmm. there's no way we will expect double standard people to be able to lead us because mm -hmm. that means that you're not virtuous enough for us to be able to trust you with our welfare wow. and when i say we i say young people. young people we are very clear on the basic things that we need a functional economy translates to jobs mm. translates to security it translates mm. to achieving our dreams and goals in mm. whatever direction of prosperity you may think of you mm. know and all of that is baseless if those that want to stand up and say i can lead mm. we cannot trust that in your own frame and your own spaces where you gather up your collective mind and says we can mm. You are unable to can your little things. How will you can the big things? Yeah, I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. It, it does make sense. Um, in in that, I mean, following that logic, um, they all seem to be in disarray. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then you you then wonder why we are we are having this huge battle of saying register to vote. You know, I I think it is important to register to vote. The question that my peer would ask me is why mm. to what end <laughs> you know and yes it will represent your voice yes but who is the true representation of my voice <laughs> you know and when there's no who remember the agenda to then yeah. register to vote becomes very difficult you know so it's uh, that's why i said that my expectation would be fixing within the institutions mm. and self mm. Mm. and then coming up and being very righteous and virtuous about what is it that you are trying to achieve and why should we trust you mm. with it trust is going to be a very fundamental thing now and going into the election be consistent be consistent in the little so yeah. that we know that there's going to be consistency in the big mm. do you think that issue of register yes but why is the reason why is it contributes to why we're not seeing high registration numbers is that your sense yes really it, it's it goes back to the why we, we preach the why in one's purpose we preach the why in one's drive for business or for whatever why is why when it comes to political issues not important mm. it's an overall thing mm. why am i doing it because i want to know that i'm going to use up my time and then achieve something mm. or contribute to something mm. if then i don't find mm. how my contribution works mm. do i then do it mm. you know so it's it's that conversation where it's like well nonetheless register to vote well nonetheless i'll do it i guess whenever you know it's it's it, it's there's where no the difference, there's no passion. there's no urgency yeah urgency yeah urgency. Say, we need to actually do this now okay now mm. why why yeah <laughs> you know i can do it later or oh, never or you know so i guess that 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 specific part of saying knowing the why mm. does not only apply to personal development mm. it does not apply to business development it also applies to community development mm. but but why how much of so? that normally so what i mean what you what you're saying right now i subscribe to it 100% but i get the sense that i'm not seeing it with a lot of our young people both in the opposition and the in the in the ruling party i don't get the sense that the why question is asked i don't get the sense that the 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 the, the values the purity that you ask you're talking about that's your generation embraces that am i am i getting this thing wrong um yeah i'll tell you you're getting it I'm wrong i'm getting it wrong okay um and here's where yeah i believe that in the institutions of politics and the halls of politics there's a there's a culture of never asking the why because it sounds like you are questioning authority mm. even in families mm. your father says 
in this house, we get in at 6 p.m. when the tower light goes on. <laughs> it's summer. The sun sets at 7. Yeah. You want to play more mom china outside. Yes. So you ask why. Why? And some other households like, you do not question your father when they say, or you don't question the leader of the household when they say. So because there's no culture of mm. even asking why to understand mm. and then why to be able to hold somebody accountable, you then never get that sense. Those who are participating are participating religiously, if I could say that, mm. say, well, this is how things are done. So let us continue with how things are done. Mm. And those who are not participating are not even... Mm. making their why mm. audible enough. So you, you have been great success. You've inspired a lot of young women, a lot of young people, you and uh, Kudam Sasio. Um, looking at your life, what has been the biggest mistakes that you, mistake that you have made that you regret? You look back and say, wow, that humbled me and it taught me something. Um, that would have to be my university experience. Yeah. I think failing my certain parts of my of my degree, it challenged me to think, am I not as smart as I yeah. thought I, I was? Or yeah. that the rest of my years has been validating. I've always been a top five student, you know, like why is this one thing yeah. not working out? And like I said, I, it was when my lecturer then said, this is a case of discipline, it's not about understanding. The lesson from that was not everything needs to be understood, mm. but everything that requires you to do it may require you to do it. So you have to, <laughs> <laughs> you just have to. You, you spoke about something that I've heard a couple of people that have come onto this show speak about, which is imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. How much of that is an issue with you? A lot. A lot. A lot. Um, because of where you are operating from, every day you're trying to make small gains, you know, th that's how you move with it. It's only when you are connecting the dots from behind to say, oh, well, what great strides this has been. And when somebody else tells you, because they're seeing more of a broader picture, you're like, well, it's not that great. Is I mean, me? I, there's, still, there's still some yeah. things to do, but... Who, me? No, mm. not me. And you're like, ha, ah, why, why me? And having mm. to then look at yourself, evaluate yourself, yeah. yeah. What exactly they're seeing is what is on the ground. You, you've walked this path. You've, it's you've you done it. It is it. you, you know? So clap hands for yourself, you too. <laughs> How do you overcome it when it stands in front of you, imposter syndrome? Positive self-talk. Okay. One. To, um, to be honest, my partner, uh -huh. he, he, he becomes louder than the, the voice inside, you know, and says, what do you mean? You're yeah. a 10 out of 10. You know, you, you are good. You in, are the In farmer. his usual you know style. I mean? In his usual style. Yeah. And then you, the, the few people that you trust when yeah. they sound that yeah. to you, you're like, but of course, mm. you know, they, that has been, but then positive self-talk with the 5am club routine, just yeah. learning how to say yeah. to yourself, Yes, I am doing it. I am going to do it and then do it. Mm. And then when you do it, say, well executed. Mm. Yeah. The, the imposter syndrome in the marketplace that you were working in, uh, failure picking yourself up when you, when you fail, the way our society deals with women in the workplace and just generally, are we doing well as a society? Do you come across instances where you are treated in a certain manner because you are a woman? You are not uh, Mr. Msasiwa, but Mrs. Msasiwa? Uh, most of the times it happens. Yeah. Sometimes to an advantageous point, because if you are the wife of the boss, there's some reverence to it, right? And you have to then remind people that at this very moment, I am not wife to the other boss. I am the boss, you know, just recognizing that. I think from male colleagues and um, fellow workers having to say, ah, no, it's not Baba. It's like, no, we are not in a family setup. <laughs> Dana and Minana can do that, yeah. you know. Um, at this place, 
this is the hierarchy yeah you go through here you mm. know so i've seen that in the boardroom mm -hmm. it has got to be the toughest one i found myself being the only woman sometimes in a boardroom mm -hmm. uh one instance that we had story time um we were in a boardroom when we were discussing uh we had a it was a general meeting anyway and then everyone says um we we'll need to write minutes and all of them looked at me so i also looked back <laughs> i was like uh who were we suggesting was going to write the minutes and they said me i'm like no we are going to find a secretary that is going to write the minutes a secretary was found <laughs> and That's the minutes were taken you know but so it's i guess it's a constant reminder of people that we are equals mm. and sometimes they don't do it because they're trying to make you feel inferior it's just the way the culture is like so you have to constantly remind them and when people are reminded they it's a terrible culture i mean i've got a daughter and uh we wanted to grow up being treated like a human being not the other mm. are we doing well as a society in the workplace and generally in terms of messaging to um, both the boy child and the girl child I think policy-wise on paper, mm. yes. Practice, our different cultures still have a huge influence on how we deal with certain things. You know, um, I'll use the Shona culture. Uh, people can usually find each other and, you know, make relations good for productivity, good for work, but also very bad for um, accountability. Mm. You know, and going to kurvangu or, you know, like, whoa, you know, it's, it's all of those stories that come up in the workplace that mm. the policy is there on paper. How do we translate it so that our culture does not intercept mm. that? And I think we still have a long way to go when it mm. comes to that. Mm. Mm. What's the next big thing for you? Um, the Let's Farm project that I'm working on. Aha. Yes. Uh, it's a crowdfunding platform mm -hmm. that will empower... It's called Let's Farm. Let's Farm Africa, mm -hmm. yes. It's a crowdfunding platform that's going to empower small-scale farmers to be able to access funding from um, microfinanciers. So our big first target is uh, the diasporans who want to invest back home into 90, day, 90 to 120 day projects of farming, mm. getting your small returns. So by micro uh, investments and the nature of investments, there's a win or lose, but then with stuff that we've learned over time, mm. we're trying to ensure that the risk is minimal. But then we want also the smallholder farmer to be able to go back into farming should they you know face certain challenges which has been some some of the biggest issues that we were dealing with to say i got hit by the rains mm. you know mm. what could have prevented that mm. simple greenhousing shed netting could have prevented that but then the funding for that is not necessarily available in the traditional institutions mm. you know and fair enough it's not there but then there's other ways that we can yeah. do it so that's what let's farm is going to be focusing on wow yeah. looking forward to that project coming up <laughs>
um, keeping yeah. investor money <laughs> and losing investor money. Right. You know, as we prepare ourselves for expanding the business, calling on investors to invest in us, it's, it's been something that we say, okay, how do we work on it? Because mm. watching our money has been one of those tricky positions. Oh, it's no longer your money and it's other people's yeah. money. They, there's more pressure. There's more pressure yeah. to it. And, and also like accountability. Sometimes yeah. you go, oh, well, I lost, but... Yeah. It can't be that. How important is reading to you as, as far as your business is concerned and your life journey? The lessons mm -hmm. are not something that you'll pick up on the streets. Mm -hmm. And the more and more the world becomes into their devices mm -hmm. and less more of a communal, let's sit down, let's talk. The best place for you to have a conversation with someone to give you information mm. that you need is mm. through a book. Mm. I'd, I'd, I'd say that. Mm. It's been very important for me. What I didn't know, I learned from a book. That's There's interesting. a book about farming. Mm. Complete, mm. Many mm. manuals, but then like a whole book of a story about how somebody else got into mm. farming. And mm. their designs, their models have been very influential in mine. So, yeah. Mm. I guess the fourth one will be the, yeah, which will be, what's his name? The market gardener. Oh, right. That'd be my fourth one. Okay. Um, do you have mentors? I mean, I'm I'm wondering. Do you have mentors? Do you mentor other people? Um, online ones. Hmm? Online ones. Okay. Robin Sharma is one of my biggest mentors. Okay. At the moment. So you do his online um, classes, classes too, and seminars, also, and yeah. yeah. So the, 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 he's, he's one of those. I haven't been able to get a mentor. I don't think I've consciously looked for one. Yeah. And that's also been because of my, what is my idea of a mentor? Mm. Yeah. Have I mentored other people? Mm. Yes, the women that I work with. Mm. But then also it's at a very hands-off yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, yeah, normally. So a very um, thoughtful conversation thought-provoking conversation, I must say. Uh, there's a purity in you that I wasn't aware existed in you that has just uh, um, um, totally got me so excited. Um, I'm, we're watching you, social media is watching you, and we're very impressed by what you're doing. You, you, I think you and your husband, not I think, definitely, certainly, <laughs> you and your husband have inspired the young generation to get into farming and you're doing it the right way. I wish you nothing but the very best. Thank you so much, Trevor. Fantastic. And thank you all to all the viewers for watching. Fantastic. Normally, so allow me to turn to our viewers who are all over the world who tune in every Monday. Remember, we are a weekly show. We are up at 7 a.m. on Monday on YouTube, Central African time. Um, to ensure that you don't miss out on these quality conversations like the one I've just had now with Normally. So please click onto this red button and subscribe. You'll get a notification every time we have one of these quality conversations. We've gone a step further. Yes, we've created uh, podcasts and we'll be creating more podcasts. Uh, roll down below this video and click to the link uh, for your listening pleasure. We see all your comments. Um, your suggestions as to who the ne our next guest should be. We love that. Keep on sharing and keep on watching. Until next time, cheers to you all.